Okay, meanwhile, there, over the weekend, the other big news is that there was this terrible shooting at uh, the Madden, I guess it was Madden uh, tournament in Jacksonville, Florida. This is a gamer tournament, so basically people get together and they play Madden for money, uh, Madden football. And uh, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office identified the alleged shooter as a white male who had died at the scene. Uh, he was 24 years old from Baltimore, so he was coming obviously from a gun-free zone because Baltimore, as we know, doesn't have any gun control laws except for how it has tons of gun control laws. He died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound inside Chicago Pizza after going on a shooting rampage that left two dead and 11 other people injured. It was a gun-free zone with not enough security. And this is the typical story, unfortunately, of a lot of these sorts of mass shootings. When you have a public event, a popular event, popular public event, you have to have people there with guns. And my sister's wedding happened. I paid personally for security with guns to make sure that nobody could actually get into my sister's wedding. And that was a private event. This is a major public event that was a gun-free zone where they didn't have enough security. And this guy got in with a gun. He was a disappointed gamer. So he had gone in the first round, he had lost. And then he was so upset with his life that he went out and decided to murder a bunch of people, which is just evil and sick. Uh, he used at least one handgun in his attack. So a ban on assault rifles would apparently do nothing. Uh, he had previously appeared in a photo with a Buffalo Bills player after winning another competition. There's been no motive announced for the killings. There are reports that he snapped after losing an event. He stayed at a local hotel the night before the shooting. They've impounded his car. The investigation is still ongoing. EA Sports issued a statement saying, we are aware of an incident at a sanctioned Madden Championship Series competition in Jacksonville. We are working with authorities to gather facts at this stage. This is a horrible incident. Our deepest sympathies go out to all involved. I want to point out the hypocrisy of folks in the media who are immediately jumping to gun control today. It's hilarious because literally five days ago, they were suggesting that it was impossible. You should not politicize the killing of Molly Tibbetts in Iowa. You should certainly not say that that has anything to do with illegal immigration. That would be politicization of the issue. And I discussed at length on Friday what's true about that and what's not true about that. The fact that we know more about Molly Tibbetts' killing than we know about the average mass shooting in the first few days. And that's why you can say with a certain amount of certainty that illegal immigration had something to do with the Molly Tibbetts killing, where in this case, we don't know where he got the gun. We barely know what kind of gun the guy used. We don't know about his criminal history. We don't know about his psychological history. There are a lot of other issues that conflate and confound. The media immediately jumped to gun control because it was deeply necessary for them to push their agenda. This just shows the hypocrisy of so many in the media who are willing to overlook uh, the, their, their ban on politicization of major events so long as it pushes their particular agenda. Uh, the police have ID'd this guy. It does raise some questions about the, the lack of purpose in American society. There are a lot of folks today talking about relationship between gaming and all of this. That, of course, is spurious. This was, first of all, not a violent video game, so you can't even make that connection. It was a, it was a football video game. But the idea that you are a professional video game player at 24 years old and that basically your job consists of sitting in a room alone and playing video games I can't say I think that that's great for society that more and more people are doing that. And that's not a rip on people who play video games. We have tons of people at the office who play video games, tons of people who play Madden. But it seems to me that part of a well-rounded life should be getting out a little bit more. And it appears that this guy was not getting out a little bit more. As I've said about mass shootings before, we do have a problem with masculinity in our society. Not that all masculinity is toxic, but the opposite. If you do not task young men with going out, this guy's 24. I was married by the time I was 24. I had a job by the time I was 24 years old. I graduated from law school by the time I was 24. The fact that 24 years old in American society now is considered a kid, that the level of responsibility that attaches to people in their mid-20s is basically zero, that you're expected to live at home, mooching off your parents, not for reasons that you have family solidarity, but just because you don't want to pay your bills, and that you do this all the way until you're basically 30, and then you start looking to get married and have a family. The prolonged adolescence of young men is not good for American society for a variety of reasons. Now. Is that leading to an uptick in the number of mass shootings like this? It seems like there is some basic connection. I don't think that it is the main factor. I think that there are a bunch of factors that are, that are conflated here. But to refuse to acknowledge that young men are not being treated with the level of responsibility necessary from the time they are teenagers to mature into fully blown adult human beings who are capable of handling their lives is a mistake. Also, it'll be interesting to see what this guy's psychological history was and how well it was taken care of. Okay, in just a second, I want to talk about what I think is actually the, in some ways, the worst story of the day. Okay, this is the worst story of the day. It really is a terrible story, and it speaks to the liberalization of the Catholic Church and a serious problem with institutional protection. So a few weeks ago, we talked about, probably two weeks ago, we talked about the scandal that broke out in the state of Pennsylvania with regard to the archdiocese in Pennsylvania covering up over 30 years, a thousand cases of child molestation in the church. And we talked about 
the problems that exist within every institution, the, the tendency to cover for the problems of an institution in order to quote unquote protect the institution. And this exists not only in the Catholic Church, it exists in various religious communities around the country and around the world. It exists in governments, certainly. It exists in public schools. There's always, the, the human instinct is to feel solidarity with a particular structure you find to be important. And then whenever that structure is threatened, particularly if it's threatened routinely, you tend to circle the wagons and defend anything that's happening in-house. And this is how you end up with the, with the quiet ascent to true evil that happens so often around the planet. You wonder how Nazi Germany happened. Basically, there was a population that for bad reasons and wrongly felt threatened by the outside world, decided to circulate, uh, basically circle the wagons around the Nazi regime. And then the Nazi regime decided to kill all of the enemies of the people, including the Jews. And people went along with that because the in-group was more important than the out-group, and the out-group was, was threatening them. In-group, out-group politics is deeply important when it comes to understanding how institutions get perverted from the inside. Well, now there's stories that basically the institutional perversion of the Catholic Church has reached up to the top levels of the Catholic Church. This is from the, the NC Register, the National Catholic Register. In an extraordinary 11-page written testament, a former apostolist, apostolic nuncio to the United States has accused several senior prelates of complicity in covering up Archbishop Theodore McCarrick's allegations of sexual abuse and has claimed that Pope Francis knew about sanctions imposed on then Cardinal McCarrick by Pope Benedict XVI, but chose to repeal them. Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, 77, who served as apostolic nuncio in Washington, D.C. from 2011 to 2016, said that in the late 2000s, Benedict had imposed on Cardinal McCarrick sanctions similar to those now imposed on him by Pope Francis, and that Vigano personally told Pope Francis about those sanctions in 2013. So McCarrick has been accused of sexual abuse of young seminarians. Uh, he's also been accused of engaging in homosexual acts with a bunch of people who are under his auspices, which is a violation, obviously, of church code and church conduct. And he was not turned over to the proper authorities. Uh, the, the, there are no allegations that the church knew about him molesting underage boys. But if, there, if such allegations had existed and the church didn't turn him over to the secular authorities, it's a serious problem. The truth is that the, the question of church justice, just historically speaking, speaking stretches back a millennia. Uh, it stretches back all the way back to when you know Henry II trying to say that we should actually try priests in secular courts in Great Britain at the very in England in you know the in the 12th and 13th centuries, so the, this sort of battle between secular and and church has been going on for a very long time. But one of the premises of the idea that the church should handle its own business that the church will actually handle its own business, the church did not handle its own business. According to Archbishop Vigano, he said in his written statement, simultaneously released to the Register and other media, that Pope Francis continued to cover. For McCarrick, and not only did he not take into account the sanctions that Pope Benedict had imposed on him, but also made McCarrick his trusted counselor. Vigano's story has now been backed by a couple of other sources. He said the former Archbishop of Washington advised the Pope to appoint a number of bishops in the United States, including Cardinals Bla uh, I think it's pronounced Blaise Kupich of Chicago and Joseph Tobin of Newark. Archbishop Vigano, who said his conscience dictates the truth be known as the corruption has reached the very top of the church's hierarchy, ended his testimony by calling on Pope Francis and all those implicated in the cover-up of Archbishop McCarrick's abuse to resign. The accusation basically suggests that McCarrick has abused legitimately dozens of people. The media has reported written written reports of victims of abuse spanning decades, including a teenage boy, three young priests or seminarians, and a man now in his 60s who alleges that McCarrick abused him from the age of 11. The Pope later accepted McCarrick's resignation from the College of Cardinals. But, but Bagano wrote that Benedict much earlier had imposed sanctions on McCarrick, similar to those handed down by Cardinal Perelin. The Cardinal was to leave the seminary where he was living. He was forbidden to celebrate mass in public, to participate in public meetings, to give lectures, to travel with the obligation of dedicating himself to a life of prayer, and penance. He said the sanctions were applied as far back as 2009-2010. Benedict's measure came years after Archbishop Vigano's predecessor at the nunciature had immediately informed the Holy See as soon as they had learned of Archbishop McCarrick's gravely immoral behavior with seminarians and priests. Basically, the accusation here is that all of these memos were ignored by the top levels of the, of the College of Cardinals and the papacy. Vigano claims he wrote several memos to a series of cardinals who repeatedly refused to do anything about this. They basically gave in to what he essentially calls a homosexual clique in the Catholic Church. Vigano says that he personally repeated the sanction to McCarrick and the Cardinal, muttering in a barely comprehensible way, admitted he had perhaps made the mistake of sleeping in the same bed with some seminarians at his beach house, but he said this as if it had no importance, Vigano says in his testimony. Apparently, Pope Francis 
knew about all of this. He said it was clear that from the time of Pope Francis' election, McCarrick, now free from all constraints, had felt free to travel continuously to give lectures and interviews. He said McCarrick, who backed Pope Francis, became the kingmaker for appointments in the Curia and the United States and the most listened to advisor in the Vatican for relations with the Obama administration. He says that appointments of other cardinals were orchestrated by McCarrick. It is a massive, massive scandal. And Catholics are, there, there are a lot of traditional Catholics who are looking at this and wondering if Pope Francis can actually survive this, whether Pope Francis should step down for having helped cover all of this up because Pope Francis has been extraordinarily soft on LGBT issues. It's something the media have taken note of for a very long time. And there's a feeling among traditional Catholics that perhaps his softness on those issues led him to basically look the other way with regard to this Archbishop McCarrick, who is actually engaged in violations of Catholic code with other seminarians alongside allegations of him molesting underage kids. Really, really troubling stuff. But again, any institution that refuses to cleanse itself is going to pay the price for all of this. You know, Pope Francis tweeted out something insane about this. He tweeted out something like, he prays for the victims, he prays to Mary for the victims, and it's like, dude, you're the Pope. Now it's time for you to actually do something about it, right? You're, you, it seems like you could be in a position to help God out here. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a Catholic, but it seems like if you're the Pope, you might be in a position to actually you know, help cleanse the Catholic Church of this stuff, as opposed to just tweeting out vague references to prayer. Right? I, I'm not usually a person who says that prayer is not an answer, but when it comes to you having the power to do something about this at the head of a church to cleanse your own church of this stuff, you're going to need to do more than pray about this. This one ain't on God. This one's on the church. You're going to have to, and this is true for Jewish communities and Catholic communities and Protestant communities and Muslim communities. It is true for every community. A community that fails to cleanse itself of evil is a community that, that becomes complicit in that evil.